You know, there, there are no flowers in Grootmerik. It's not a bad place for millies, and I once grew some quite good onions at the bottom behind the dam. But what you can call flowers is a rare thing. <laughs> no, I've, I've had three. Things. What you can call flowers is a rare thing. Perhaps it's the heat or the drought. Yet, whenever I talk about flowers, I think of Willem Prinsloo's farm at the Beaterskop, where the dance was. And I think of Fritz Pretorius sitting pale and sick by the roadside. And I think of the white rose that I wore in my hat jauntily. But most of all, I think of Grita. Now, if you walk across my farm and look out towards the northwest, you can see a Beaterskop sticking out there by the Dwarsberger. People will tell you that there are ghosts there. And that witches once lived there. I can well believe that. I've only been at Abiatorskop once. And that was many years ago. I've never been back. It's not because of the ghosts, nor was it the witches. Grita Prinsloo was due back from finishing school in Zierest. <laughs> where she gone to learn English dictation, manners and other high class subjects. <coughs> Therefore Willem Prinsloo, her father, had arranged a big dance on his farm at the Beaterskop to celebrate Grita's return. I was invited to the party. So was Fritz Pretorius. <laughs> so was every white person from Derdepoort to Remotso. And what's more, practically everybody went. Of course, we were all somewhat nervous about meeting Rita. What with all the high class subjects she'd been learning at finishing school. We felt we couldn't talk to her in a chatty sort of way that you can with an ordinary boor girl. But what fetched us all to Abiaterskop in the end was the knowledge that Willem Prinsloo made the best, best peach brandy in the district. And even though I couldn't bring my horse here because the blimmin' thing is bolted, I managed to bring some peach brandy all the way from Groot Marinko. And you will notice if you read in the press all the press notices about today's Entertainment, it's only for those in the front row. Yeah. So it's just me and Everard Jr. that are going to enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been told, I've also been warned by management, Everard Sr. and company, that you drink this at your own risk. You will see that it looks like hardly anything, but believe you me, Ian Slicky, and you've had it. <laughs> okay, I'll relent. I'll give it to the next row. That side first. I'll give it to this row. Do me a favor, you know, you can share this like Nachmar wine, okay? Yeah. Just, just share it. Take one one and pass it on there. I'm taking to the back. There you go. You take it there. Okay, you see, he's already sorted. It looks like. You share that with the, with the three good ladies here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, try, try that, sir. Try that. Would you like something? So the front is out. All right. Are we ready? Have we got it there? Cheers. Cheers. Go down to my leg now.
Don't insult good peach brandy, sir. Grapper. Oh. It's not as um, harsh as grapper. <laughs> Fritz Pretorius spoke of the difficulty brought by Gitte's learning. Yes, yeah, sure, I'm feeling about a bit shaky about meeting Gitte. Yeah, but I've been, I've been rubbing up on my education though. Last night I took out my slate that I'd last used uh, when I left school 17 years ago and I did a few sums. I, I did some addition and subtraction. I tried multiplication, but I've forgotten how it's done. <laughs> I told Fritz I'd like to have helped him, but I've never got as far as multiplication. <laughs> <laughs> the day the dance arrived. The postcard bearing Gitte to her father's house passed through Drugendal in the morning. <laughs> The sound effects are awesome. In the afternoon, I got dressed. I wore a, a black jacket, fawn trousers, and a pink shirt. And, and I put on my brown boots I bought about a year ago and never had occasion to wear them. I mean, it would look foolish walking around the farm in shop boots when everybody was wearing homemade felt school. I believed. As I got on my horse and I set off down Government Avenue with my hat rakishly to one side, <laughs> that I'd easily be the best dressed young man at the dance. It was getting on towards sunset when I reached the foot of the Aviatus Corp, which I had to skirt in order to reach Willem Prinsloo's farm, nestling in a hollow behind some hills. I felt as I rode that it was foolish and stupid for a man to go and live in a pot that was reputed to be haunted. <laughs> <laughs> the trees grew taller and denser as they do on the rising ground. <laughs> it also got a lot darker. <laughs> Accordingly, I spurred my horse onto a gallop, wanting to get out of this gloomy region as quickly as possible. I mean, a horse is sensitive things like ghosts and witches and, and, and it was getting so dark that I recall stories of, 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 of witches who'd, who'd, who'd caught travellers who were lost along the way. You could easily lose your way amongst these tall trees. <laughs> and as I say, my horse was sensitive and I didn't want to, to frighten my horse unnecessarily, especially as a cold wind suddenly shot it through the port and once or twice it was like an evil voice calling my name. <laughs> I rode very fast then. <laughs> After a while I looked around and Realize my position. It was Fritz Pretorius galloping up behind me. <laughs> <laughs> What's your hurry? Fritz asked as I slowed down to allow his overtaking me. No, I wanted to get out of those tall trees. I didn't want my horse to get frightened. <laughs> ah. Is that why you were riding with your arms around his neck, eh? <laughs> to soothe him. <laughs> I did not reply. <laughs> but what I did notice that Fritz was also very stylishly dressed. True, I beat him as far as shirt and boots were concerned, but Fritz had on a new grey suit with the socks pulled up over the bottoms of his trousers. He also had a handkerchief which he <coughs> ostentatiously took out of his pocket several times. <laughs> of course, I couldn't get annoyed with a fellow like Fritz. I, I, I couldn't get jealous of a fellow like Fritz Pretorius. I was just annoyed by the thought that he'd make himself look ridiculous by going to a party with an outlandish thing like a, a handkerchief. We arrived at the Prince Who's Farm. 
There were so many ox wagons drawn up in the felt the place looked like a log. Prince Lou met us at the door. Go through Carol's, the peach brands in the kitchen, and the dancings in the forays. Although the forays was big, it was so crowded that it was almost impossible to dance. But it was not as crowded as the kitchen. <laughs> Nor was the music in the forays, which was provided by a number of men on guitars and concertinas, as loud as the music in the kitchen, where there was no band. <laughs> Every man sang for himself. <laughs> you could tell this was going to be a good party. After I'd been in the kitchen for about half an hour, I decided to go through to the forays. It seemed a lot further now, <laughs> the forays from the kitchen. <laughs> and I had to lean against the wall several times to think. <laughs> Memories <now. laughs> There were other men leaning against the wall like that. <laughs> Thinking. <laughs> what? What? One man thought he could think even better. He sat on the floor with his head on his knees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> you could tell Willem Prince who made good beach brandy. <laughs> then I saw Fritz Petorius. And the sight of him brought me to my senses right away. <laughs> Eerily flapping his handkerchief <laughs> in time to the music. He, he was talking to a young girl who smiled up at him with bright eyes and red lips and small white teeth. I knew at once this was Gita. She was tall and slender and very pretty. And around the dark hair was a wreath of white roses I could see being picked that morning in Zerest. Also, she didn't appear to be the kind of girl in front of whom I had to be educated and clever. In fact, I felt I didn't need my 12 times table that I tore off the back of a school writing book and thrust into my jacket pocket before leaving home. <coughs> it was quite difficult for me to get a word in with Fritz hanging around, but I managed it eventually. While I was talking to her, I noticed out of the corner of my eye and with great satisfaction the direction Fritz took. Into the kitchen flapping his handkerchief behind him into the kitchen <laughs> where the laughter was and the singing and the peach brandy. <laughs> I told Rita that I am Skulk Lawrence. Oh yes, I've heard all about you from Fritz Pretorius. <laughs> I knew what that meant. I told him Fritz Pretorius was the biggest liar in America. I told her other things about Fritz. Ten minutes later, while I was still talking to her about Fritz, she smiled up at me and said, I could tell her the rest some other night. No, but, but I must tell you this now. I insisted. When Fritz learned that he was meeting you here at the dance, he started doing homework. I told her about the sweat and the sums. And she laughed softly. And once more I was struck by how pretty she was. And her eyes were radiant in the candlelight. And the roses stood white against the dark hair. And all the time around us the dancers whirled and the band played lively dance tunes in the forays. And from the kitchen there issued weird sounds of jubilation. The rest happened very quickly. I don't know how it came about, but once we were outside amongst the tall trees under the starlight, I could easily believe that Gita wasn't a girl at all, but one of the witches of a Beatriskop who wove strange spells. And to listen to me talking, nobody would believe the wild and thrilling things that were going on in my heart. I told Gita about last year's drought. 
and the difficulty we have in, in keeping the white ants from our doors and window frames. <laughs> and, and now my new brown boots tend to take the skin off my toes if I walk too quickly. <laughs> then I moved up closer. Rita, I said, taking her hand, there's something I must tell you. She, she pulled her hand away. She did it gently, though, sorrowfully almost. Yes, I know what you're going to say. I was surprised at that. How do you know, Rita? <laughs> I haven't been to finishing school for nothing, you know. <laughs> oh, Rita, I don't want to talk to you about the rhythmic and sums. I, I, I want to tell you that... that don't, don't skulk. Don't tell me. I, I don't think I even deserve it. I don't, but you're so lovely, Rita. I want to tell you how lovely you are. And at that moment that I stepped forward, she retreated swiftly, eluding me. Couldn't understand how she timed it so well. Try as I might, I followed as best I could. She sped swiftly and gracefully through the trees. And I tried to catch her. <laughs> it was not just my want of learning that handicapped me. It was also my new brown boots. <laughs> and Willem Prince Lou's peach brandy. <laughs> and the shaft of the, of the ox cart. The lower end that rests in the grass. <laughs> but I didn't fall too hard then. For even as I fell in the long, thick grass, a great feeling of happiness came over me. And I didn't care about anything else in the world. Gita had stopped running. She turned around. And for an instant, her body, slender and misty in the shadows, swayed towards me. Her hand flew up to her hair, and her fingers pulled at the wreath. And the next moment, there lay within the reach of my own hand a small white rose. I shall never forget the thrill with which I picked up the white rose. <coughs> and how I trembled when I stuck it into my hat. I shall always remember the stir I caused when I walked into the kitchen. Everybody stopped drinking to look at the white rose. The young men made jokes about it. The older men winked at me and slapped me on the back. And although Fritz Pretorius wasn't there to witness my triumph, I knew he'd hear about it somehow. That would make him realize it was impudence for a young fellow like him to set himself up as Scott Lawrence's rival. The rest of the night, I was a hero. The men in the kitchen made me sit on the table. They plied me with peach brandy and they drank to my health. <laughs> ah. And afterwards, when a dozen of men carried me out to an ox wagon well, for fresh air, they fell with me only once. <laughs> At daybreak, I was still on their wagon. I was feeling very sick. <laughs> Until I remembered Gita's rose. There it was, stuck in my hat somewhere. <laughs> stuck in my hat. For the whole world to know that Gita Prince had chosen me above all other men. But what I 
didn't know was that I'd remained on that ox maybe hours after everybody had gone home. Quietly, I got on my horse, glad that nobody was astir as I rode away. My head was busy, but in my heart there were green wings beating. And although it was day now, there was that same soft breeze that blew when Grita had flung that rose at me, standing under the starlight. I rode slowly through the trees of Abiaterskop. And when I reached the place where the path turned south again, I saw something which made me wonder whether at these fashionable schools they don't teach the girls too much. First I saw Fritz Pretorius' horse standing by the roadside. <laughs> then I saw Fritz sitting up against a thorn tree with his chin on his knees. <laughs> he looked very pale and sick. But what made me wonder much about these finishing schools was that in Fritz's act, which lay on, on the ground some distance from him, was a small white rose. Thank <laughs> you.